Bible says this, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. <laughs> then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse ones from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it was raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, and devour much flesh. And after this, behold, or after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse, or different, from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns, and I consider the horns. And behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there was three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the judgment was set, and the books were opened. And I beheld then, because the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory, and a kingdom that all the people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that will, which shall not be destroyed. We'll stop there for tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessing upon his word upon this time. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you, Lord, so much for your grace and mercy once again. Lord, I pray now that you'll just touch me, Lord, you will truly anoint me to be able to bring your word in power. That, Lord, you'll truly help me to have the ability, or that you give to teach your word. Father, I just pray that you'll let your word go forth in power. That, Lord, it won't just go from my mouth into their mind, but that, Lord, it would truly come from the pages of your book into their hearts. I pray, Lord, that you'll use this to motivate them, to remind them, to refresh them. I pray, Lord, that your people are fed and, Lord, educated when it comes to your word. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you'll just use this to motivate us to be about your business or to be about ministering to all those that you would have us minister to, all that we would come in contact with. Lord, I just truly pray that your word would be magnified tonight, that, Lord, if there's anyone that's lost that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that this would be the night that they would turn from their sin. And Lord, you tell us in your word, for all have sinned and fallen short of your glory, fallen short of your standard. It's broken your laws, your holy commandments, and that the wages of sin, the wages of breaking your commandment, Lord, is hell and death forever and ever. And Lord, I praise you for the good news of the gospel that says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life, eternal forgiveness through Christ Jesus our Lord, and that, Lord, if they'll put their trust in you, they'll put their trust in your finished work that you accomplished for them on the cross by paying for all of their sins, past, present, and future. Lord, dying in our place so that we wouldn't have to suffer the wrath of God. 
We're being raised from the dead on the third day. Lord, you tell us in your word all those that are willing to call upon your name, asking you to forgive them, being willing to turn from sin. Lord, all those that call upon your name shall be saved, forgiven forever. So, Lord, I just pray that if that be true of one tonight, that they would truly give their heart and their life to you. And, Lord, live the rest of their days for you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, in Daniel chapter 7, we've come to a major transition in the book of Daniel. Now, 62 years have passed from the time that Daniel was taken until the Lord gave him this dream in chapter number 7. The year is around 541, and we're going back now a little bit before Belshazzar. He's been in office now for about a year or two. And this is where we find ourselves, so we're backing up in time a little bit. The Medes and the Persians were on their way, they were coming, but that was in the future. That had not taken place yet in Daniel chapter 7, so we're going backwards in time a little bit. And we saw in Daniel and his companions, we learned a lot about his personal life. And the Lord put all this in the Bible to forever be a reminder to us that our God is just as he was able to help them and help Daniel, he's also still able to help us beat temptation, amen, to uh, get us through difficult times and difficult places in our life. It also teaches us that God is faithful and it pays to be faithful to him, amen, that our God is able and he's able to deliver us out of any situation according to his will that he wants to do, amen. Our God is able to exceedingly, abundantly do more than we can think or ask. And that literally means super, exceedingly, super over the top abundantly is what it means in the Greek, if you will. It gives that expression that he can just do so much more than we can think or ask. And we praise God that we serve a God that can do that. Amen. He's also reminding us that God can fully and totally and completely be trusted with our lives, our very lives, our very eternity. Amen? And so he's teaching them and he's teaching us that living right also may cause you to end up in a lion's den. That living right may bring you to a furnace of fire. And that doing the right thing can bring a lot of trouble into your life. But again, he teaches us that being faithful to him always pays in the end. Amen? Amen. Also, that your life counts. God teaches us that your life, your words, your actions, what you do, the decisions that you make absolutely count for eternity and count for other people's lives. So, God allows us to know that just as their lives made an impact, four teenagers, when they showed up, man, basically began to change a whole entire nation. Amen? They were able to witness to a pagan king. I believe that Nebuchadnezzar ultimately was converted to the Lord. But what a testimony, what a light they were to the people of God and also to all the pagans that live there. God also wants us to be reminded that we are the light, we are the salt of the earth, and that our business is to be all about people because Jesus Christ is in the business of people. Amen? He's in the soul-winning business. He's in the soul-changing business. And he gives us the privilege, according to the book of Corinthians, to be called ministers of reconciliation. We have the word of life. We have the word of truth. We have the gospel that we can share. Amen? Now, the next six chapters are going to deal with basically end-time prophecy. Now, some of it's going to deal with Daniel's near future, and some of it's going to deal with our future that hasn't even happened yet. So some of it's near... And some of it's far, far into the future, which would be in these days. So there's a lot of prophecy in Daniel that has already been fulfilled. But at the same time, there's going to be prophecy in the Word of God that hasn't been fulfilled. But I believe that it shortly will be as we live our life in this day and age. If you look at the chaos, if you look at some of the things that have already taken place, a lot of it's been fulfilled, but there's a lot of it that hasn't. But keep in mind, as we move through Daniel chapter 7 to the end of this book, that from Daniel's perspective, right, from his perspective, from his writing about these future events, Daniel himself hadn't seen most of them fulfilled. Now, there's some that he, he did see fulfilled, but there was a lot that he didn't see fulfilled. Now, you may ask, why is it important that we study prophecy from Daniel's perspective as well as also 
seeing it through the Lord's perspective? Well, we want to look at it through Daniel's perspective because we can see what's been predicted and what God has already fulfilled. And when we see what God has fulfilled, it teaches us some things about the Lord. Amen? For example, there are 333 prophecies concerning the first coming of Christ, and every one of them were fulfilled. Boy. There's also... Uh, <clears throat> Prophecy has been fulfilled, and it keeps us from being ignorant when we see prophecy that's been fulfilled. Also, if the Jews had studied the first coming of Christ, do you realize that if they really had truly studied Daniel and were to really look at it the way they were supposed to look at it, they could have, they could have known when Jesus Christ came and that Jesus Christ was the Messiah that was promised. They could have known that. They could have known that it was Jesus himself who was dying for the sins of not only the nation of Israel, but also the sins of the whole world, but they missed it. That's why the Bible says that Jesus wept. Oh, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you like a hen, does its chicks, you stone the prophets, you misuse the prophets. So they missed the time, they missed the coming, and they could have got it down to the very day almost that Christ would have came the first time. And we'll see that as we move through this. All right, I want you to see that. Now, the second coming, no man knows the day or the hour, but the first coming, that was never said, and they could have, and Jesus even pointed it out to them that they missed the fact that it was him that they were studying about. Boy. So, the first reason we study Bible prophecy is so we can see what's been predicted by God and fulfilled, which leads us to the second reason, and that is to teach us that God is absolutely truthful and that God is absolutely accurate, that God is absolutely faithful and that he can fully, totally, completely, once again, be trusted. Amen? Now, think about this. They say, statisticians, in order for just eight prophecies of a Bible to be fulfilled, the odds of that happening are this. Listen, a ten followed by 27 zeros. That is the number 10 octillion. Wow. Now that number so big, they say that it would take a computer that could count from 1 to a billion every second, 37 million years to count that high. Just for eight prophecies to come true. And yet, the Word of God tells us that all 333 prophecies had come true. Amen? Boy, our God is an awesome, accurate God. Amen? Boy. I love Proverbs 19 that says, Many are the plans of a man's heart or a woman's heart, but nevertheless the counsel of the Lord shall stand. So no matter how much finagling you do, no matter how much praying you do, God has a perfect plan and a perfect will for your life. Amen? Now, Maybe you're, you're learning, and we're still learning, but maybe you've learned that when we pray, we don't pray to change God's mind. We pray to understand and seek what the will of the Lord is, because it doesn't change. He's already had it mapped out even before there was one day that he gave you in your mother's womb. Amen? All of it's been mapped out, planned out. And I praise God that we have a God who's mapped out our life. Amen? So... <clears throat> The truthfulness of God. He's 100% accurate concerning everything he says. So the study of prophecy does several things. It gives us hope. It keeps us from being ignorant of God's plan of world events in the future. It gives us strength. It gives us encouragement to uh, man realize that no matter how chaotic, no matter how dark life can get, that God is a God who is on the throne and he's always in control. There's never a time where he's not in control. There's never a time where if we could open up heaven that we would see God pacing the floor because he's worried about something. Amen? That is not the God of the Bible. He is a God that knows. He's a God that's in control. And he is a God that is sovereign. It also teaches us that God alone <laughs> is sovereign. And he has all of history past, all of history present, all of history future. And he's the one who writes it. He's the one that dictates to it. He's the one that's in control of it all. Amen? Amen. Our God is sovereign. So, a study of prophecy also tells us that we win in the end. Amen? They call it the pan theory. It all pans out in the end, but we need to take the word theory off and make that fact. Amen? We win in the end. 
You can't usurp the authority of God. No matter how much people try, no matter what people do, they will not and cannot usurp God's authority. God ultimately will always be on top. Amen? Amen. One person asked, why does evil exist? And I like what one man said. He goes, well, I'm taking a guess, but perhaps the Lord is allowing Satan to do all that he's doing, allow all the demons to do what they're trying to do, and allow him to have the time and allow him to have every single evil that's been done, every single evil that they choose to practice, and have that evil become full bloom that so in other words it can't open anymore when the last petal of evil has been tried to usurp the authority of God that way no one will ever question and say well if they had just done this or if they had tried that maybe that would have worked no I think he's allowing all of it to take place so that there is absolutely no question in anyone's mind ever again that you can usurp God's authority because you can amen you can now do you remember the phrase that we learned in Daniel chapter 2, the time of the Gentiles and the fullness of the Gentiles? Do you remember that phrase? Well, if you don't remember, let me refresh your mind. The time of the Gentiles, what does that mean, Brother Dave? That means that the Jewish nation, particularly Jerusalem, that city, is going to be... Con going to be controlled by Gentile nations. Now, the Jewish nation controlled Jerusalem until the year 586 B.C. Now, remember in B.C. you count backwards, all right? So 586, 585, all the way down to zero till you get to the birth of Christ. So we're going backwards, but they controlled Jerusalem, but in 586 they lost their nation. They lost, if you will, uh, that city. Not not permanently, but the time of the Gentiles is when there's going to be Gentiles nations that are going to trample in Jerusalem. They're going to have some type of control in Jerusalem. They're going to have a presence in the city of Jerusalem. So the time of the Gentiles means Gentile domination over the Jews concerning Jerusalem. Jesus said in Luke 21 verse 24, listen to what Jesus said. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So there's that word, the time of the Gentiles. But then there's that other term, the fullness of the Gentiles. Now, the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2, God said, For I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem, and the city shall be taken. Now, in 1967, that was known as the Six-Day War, the Jews took back Jerusalem, but not entirely. There's still a Gentile presence in Jerusalem, and there are Muslim hordes that are right there, right alongside all those Jews. The Bible says in Zechariah 14, verse 4, the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, and in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. You remember in that dream, that big stone that came down and hit that statue of the head of gold and the breast and arms of silver and the, the waist of brass and the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay? All those represent, we remember, Gentile nations that are going to rule over Jerusalem, but that big stone was Christ. Christ is that eternal rock that's going to decimate all those nations. And when he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, the Word of God says he's going to make those nations pass under his rod of judgment, and then we'll go into what's known as the 1,000-year reign of Christ, or the millennial reign of Christ, and as a result of that, that's when the Lord is going to give all the land that he promised to the Jews, because the Jews have never owned all the land that God promised Abraham back in Genesis when he made that covenant, that promise to Abraham. So that's when God's going to fulfill all of his promises to the Jews concerning the land. They're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years during that time. And that's when Christ and the Jews are no longer going to have the Gentiles trampling underfoot their city. All right? Now, that's the terminology of the time of the Gentiles. But now the term, the fullness of the Gentiles, what is that, Brother Dave? That is when the last Gentile person on this planet turns from their sin and truly gives their heart and life to Jesus Christ. 
That's when the last Gentile gets saved. The fullness of the Gentiles has come in. All those that were Gentiles concerning the church of Jesus Christ at that time will be saved. And I believe that when that last person gets saved, that's probably when the rapture is going to take place. Amen? Amen. I said probably. I can't say for sure. There might be a little bit of time in between that, but that's what it means. It's when the last Gentile person is born again. The fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So, let's dive in and see what these sea monsters, horns, and kings are all about. That's the title that I've given this chapter 7. Sea monsters, horns, and kings. What are they all about in Daniel chapter 7? First of all, I want to call your attention to the turmoil of Daniel. The turmoil of Daniel. Daniel is finding himself in a bit of turmoil. Look at verse 15. He says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Now, Daniel's aware that these visions that he's having are beyond his scope of normal perception. That's why in Daniel chapter 10, verse 14, it says this, Now I've come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. So these visions that he's having are concerning the nation of Israel, and he's troubled because he doesn't know and understand the dream and the meanings and the symbols that God is giving to him. Daniel had a heart for his people. He sure did. He also had a heart for pagan people to see them get saved and know the truth as well, just like we need to. Amen? Why? Because Jesus Christ has a heart for everyone. Red, white, black, and yellow. Amen? If there was somebody purple skin, he'd love them too. Amen? Now, the amazing thing about the book of Daniel that perhaps would alleviate some of his turmoil that God lets us know, but that Daniel didn't know. And matter of fact, not one Old Testament prophet knew. God kept one thing in the New Testament a mystery to them, and that mystery wasn't opened up until the apostles came that Jesus Christ called. You see, a lot of people make the mistake of reading the church into the Old Testament. But God clearly tells us in the book of Ephesians that the church was a mystery. It was kept a secret, if you will, from the Jews. That's why the Jews have a difficult time seeing two comings of Christ. Have you ever been somewhere where you see a mountain range off in the distance, and yet it looks like you see two peaks that are really close together? But as you drive closer to that mountain, those two peaks seem to be farther and farther apart. Have you ever noticed that? And when you get into the mountain range, you realize how far they were, but in between those two ranges is a what? A valley. That valley is the church of Jesus Christ. You see, the Jews saw the first coming and the second coming like this. They didn't realize that God was going to put a 2,000-year gap in between the time of his death until the time of his return. Amen? So, the Jews see him coming and suffering and then coming back to rule and reign. That's why the disciples says, you know, are you coming in power? Are you coming in your kingdom to set up your rule? Remember that in the book of Acts? And then he said, hey, that is for my father to determine those times and those seasons. Remember that? So, understand, and the point is this. You cannot read the church into the Old Testament. And there's a lot of people that do. Now, listen, you can, by application, use some of those things. But to teach it literally and to say that this is talking about the church of Jesus Christ, that would not be a correct statement. Because Ephesians is very clear when it talks about the church. Are you with me? You see, the book of Daniel was not written to the Gentiles. It was written specifically to the Jewish people. Now, all of the Bible is not written to us, but all of the Bible applies to us because it's God's Word. Amen? In this case, he is writing to the Jewish nation of Israel. So these prophecies are concerning Israel. Are you with me? All right. <laughs> they're not concerning the church now is the church affected by some of the things that are going to take place based on these prophecies yes but is he talking to the church no he's talking to the nation of Israel I cannot stress that enough amen now look at the last part of verse 1 then it says this then he Daniel wrote down the dream telling the main facts so Daniel knew and trusted God Almighty, but he also knew that when God spoke to him in visions, that he was to take it seriously. 
he knew that he had a responsibility to the Lord and to the people of Israel. So God chose Daniel to be one of the authors of the Holy Scripture. And God used him to do that very thing. So Daniel was in turmoil about the visions and the dreams that he had. He didn't know what they meant. He didn't know how long it was going to last and what was going to take place. So the one who could interpret the dreams of kings, the one who could interpret the dreams of or the handwriting on the wall, is now in need of an interpreter himself. Isn't that interesting? Well, God supplies him with one. Look at verse 16. I came near to, to the one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. So don't ever forget, as a Christian, you have the greatest interpreter of Scripture of all time because there's only one God that gives Scripture, and that God lives in you if you're truly born again and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Jesus dwells in us by his Holy Spirit, and he is the author of the Bible. That's why it says in Corinthians that a pagan, a lost person, doesn't understand this book. Why? Because he's reading somebody else's mail from a different mailbox. This was written to us, those that have the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So, what are you in turmoil about tonight? What has got your heart vexed? I love the Word of God that says, All of your days were made, and yet before there was even one of them. Wow. The Bible says that you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That word workmanship means you're God's masterpiece. That's what the word means. You're his masterpiece, created unto good works for Christ Jesus. Before the foundation of the world, God had already laid out your whole life. We just have to be obedient to his leading and to his will. Amen? Amen. So we've seen Daniel's turmoil, and hopefully tonight you've learned that we have a God that you can trust, a God who says, cast all your burdens upon me for I care for you. But you have to spend time with the Lord to be able to do that. Amen? Because you can think in your mind all day long this and that, but boy, nothing like getting on your knees and saying specifically and very focused, Lord, here's my burden, here's my hurts, here's my problems, here's what's going on. Lord, this is the direction that I'm seeking you for. All of those things. And I tell you, there's nothing like being in the presence of God. So we see Daniel's turmoil, but let's move on. Let's look at the nation's turbulence. So we're going from Daniel's personal turmoil to the nation's turbulence. Boy, there was a lot of turbulence going on. Have you ever been in an airplane and you experienced turbulence? Yes. <laughs> Amen. You know, I was on a plane one time, and my wife and I were coming back from Ohio or someplace, and I they had those bins open up front, and I never knew what was in there, so I took a look in there because I was tall enough to do it. And then they had a big, long oxygen bottle in there, you know, and it supplied all the oxygen mass that came down out of the airplane. And I was thinking to myself, though, you know, because it said 100% oxygen on it. And I was like, that's not good, because when you suck on 100% oxygen and there's something going on, all that does is wake you up even more, right? They need to put laughing gas in there, amen? <laughs> Boy, hey, yeah, hey, these problems are nothing now, right? I mean, why do you want to be wide awake when you're about to slam into the side of the mountain? Amen? Boy. <laughs> and of course, too, you know, turbulence happens. Everybody gets religious really quick. You can point out the Baptists are handing out tracts. Amen? <laughs> Catholics are counting them beads, right? Right? Man, the Pentecostals, they start speaking in tongues, right? Boy, oh boy. The nation's turbulence. Look at verse 2. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of heaven were sitting, or stirring up the great sea. Now understand, Daniel, in this particular case, is using figurative language. He's using these figures of speech to have symbolic spiritual significance. And the way we know that is, listen, the best interpreter of Scripture, the best interpreter of Scripture for human beings is Scripture itself. Amen? Scripture interprets Scripture. Are you with me? And context is always king. Always king. you got to preach it in its proper, what? Context. Amen? What do I mean by that? If I were to say to you the word trunk, somebody might say, well, that could be a trunk of a car, it could be 
a, a trunk that has treasure in it. It could be, you know, so I got to give specific details in order for you to know what kind of trunk I'm talking about. Well, it's the same thing when you study God's Word. So he's using symbolic but yet spiritually significant symbols to represent things that are actually and factually on this planet. So the vision is taking place on the shores of the Great Sea. Now, back in this time frame, the Great Sea, as it was referred to, is what's known today as the Mediterranean Sea. They called it the Great Sea. So it was a real sea, the Mediterranean Sea, that goes all the way around, you know, down and around, it passes... Uh, by, it goes by France, it goes by Spain, Italy, all the way back around to where Israel's at. So the Mediterranean Sea is where we're at. Now, the four wild beasts, we're going to look at those in a moment that came up out of the sea according to verse 3. This is what verse 3 says of Daniel chapter 7. It says, And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another, different from one another. Now, these four wild beasts that we're going to look at, they represent, listen, they represent four actual nations. Different nations, but it represents four nations. And these nations all were surrounded on the shores, if you will, of the Great Sea. They found themselves right around the Great Sea. So all four of these nations are based on and located where the Mediterranean Sea is at today. Now, did you notice the words there in verse 2, stirring up? Now, that could mean the raging of the waves. It certainly could mean that. But remember now, he's using symbols. He's using words like unrest and turmoil, if you will, turbulence of these nations. Now, the word sea gives us a clue that he's not talking about physical sea, if you will, but he's really also talking about a, a, a symbolic sea, if you will, that represents these nations. How do I know? Because the word sea represents types of nations, and it represents peoples of nations. And we know that because of Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. Listen to what it says. The water which thou sawest are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So God interprets what that word means for us, and he's saying, listen, this turmoil, this stirring up, if you will, is not of the sea itself, but it's also it's referring to the stirring up of these four nations that surround, that are surrounded by the Great Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. The Bible says in Isaiah 17, verse 12 and 13, listen to this. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas and the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty water. So again, God is comparing the word water, the word sea, to people. Are you with me? Now we know that the sea is never thrown into commotion of itself. There's always an outside force acting upon the ocean, an earthquake. It creates tsunamis. You've got hurricanes. You've got storms that stir up the sea. Well, look at verse 2. The four winds were stirring up the great sea. Now, the four winds is probably a reference to the sovereignty and the providence and the power of God to control the outcome of these nations. God is saying, I'm in charge. I'm in control of these nations. I also believe that these four winds depict the universality, if you will, like four points on a compass. Uh, these winds, I believe also, personally, when we step out of the pulpit, as I've looked at this, they might also represent the principalities and the powers that are, are in the spiritual wickedness. And, and the Bible teaches us in Ephesians that we wrestle against. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Talking about Satan and his fallen angels. We also have that that likes to stir up trouble, stir up different things, and stir up nations, if you will. Satan has and will continue to use his unholy, evil forces to cause turbulence to the nations. Amen? Boy, he has. He's doing a great job on America right now. Now, in Revelation, Satan and the Antichrist will rule the entire world according to the Word of God. Revelation chapter 13 and he's going to bring all nations under his control, but thank God it's only for a short season, for seven years. Now, when you study Bible prophecy, a Bible prophecy year is not 365 days like we have. 
it's 360 days. A Jewish year in the Old Testament was 360 days, not 365 days, okay? Now, let's look at these four sea monsters that came up out of the sea. You can't understand the totality of the book of Daniel without the book of Revelation. Nor can you understand the book of Revelation unless you have the book of Daniel. So Daniel and Revelation are like the key and the lock. Daniel is the key and Revelation is the lock and they fit together and they're both used to unlock Bible in time prophecy. God's book, Daniel, is God's Old Testament key that unlocks all of the New Testament prophecy. Are you with me? Now, let's look at this first piece. Look at verse 4. The first was like a lion. So put it in the margin of your Bible or there in your notes. That represents Babylon and its king. Babylon the nation and the king of Babylon. <laughs> look at verse number 7. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which rise out of the earth. All right, so the Word of God tells us what these beasts represent. They represent the nations, and they represent the king of those nations that rise out of the earth. So the lion represents the nation of Babylon and the king of Babylon. All right, look at verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Now Babylon's emblem, when you approach the city, was two huge winged lions. They were very noticeable from a distance. That was the symbol of the city of Babylon. And Babylon conquered all the nations that surrounded them, the whole known world, like a charging lion, if you will. All right? And was done very swiftly. Referring to the wings, right? Now look at verse 4. I watched till its wings were what? Plucked off. Most scholars believe, and I also believe, that it's a reference to the seven years of insanity that Nebuchadnezzar experienced because of his pride. Verse 4 goes on to say this, And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Most scholars believe, and I also believe, that is when the sanity of Nebuchadnezzar was restored. All right? So, the first beast represents Babylon. All right? Now look at verse 5. And behold, another beast, a second like a bear. Now the bear is the strongest of beasts, if you will, after a lion. And it's distinguished for its ferocity, it's extinguished for its brute force. It fights completely different than a lion does. But it has none of the agility, it has none of the majesty that a lion has, all right? And its movements are awkward compared to that of a lion. Totally different, but yet very strength. So a bear operates by brute force and sheer strength. Now in the margin of your Bible or your notes, put Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia. All of these traits that this bear has can be seen in the Medes and the Persians. This is who this nation represents. The bear represents the Medes and the Persians. And when you watch how they went to war and you watch how they fought, they were ferocious. They were a greedy people. They gained victory over their opponents by hurling vast amounts of troops upon these nations that they conquered. They did it by brute force, by brute numbers, if you will. Now, verse 5 says that this bear was raised up on one side. What does that mean? That means that one group was stronger than the other group. And we know that for a fact that the Persians far outnumbered the Medes. They outnumbered them in troops. They outnumbered them in wealth. And they also outnumbered them in provisions. So the Persians were stronger than the Medes, but yet they were one force. They had joined together. Verse 5 goes on and it says this, And it had three ribs in the mouth of, between its teeth. Now these three ribs represent and stood for three conquered kings. Three conquered kings. And when you study the Medes and Persians and the nations that they attacked and the three kings they subdued, that was Lydia, that was Babylon, and that was Egypt. Boy, they were all devoured up by the Medes and the Persians, the bear. They thought they were unconquerable because of their huge armies. And as the bear is inferior to the lion, the Medes and Persians were inferior to Babylon. Why? 
Not in power, but the Medes and Persians were inferior to the nation of Babylon in its wealth, in its magnificence, and its government. Babylon had a better government, had more wealth, and all of those things. So you see that it's inferior, okay? Stay with me now. Daniel, so you're probably thinking, hey, brother, I'm figuring this out now, that these four wild beasts correspond with the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of in chapter 2. That gold head represents the same thing that that line represents, Babylon and its king. That gold, that silver chest of arms and, and chest of silver, that represents the same thing as this bear does in Daniel chapter 7. Are you seeing that? There's a comparison between the animals, the bear, the lion, Babylon, Medo-Persian Empire, and that statue that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of. The head of gold represented him, the king, and the nation of Babylon. The silver represented the Medo-Persian Empire and its king. The bear represents the Medo-Persian Empire, and that lion represents the what? The Babylon Empire. And did you notice how in the statue that each metal was inferior to the next? Gold, and then it went to silver, and then it went to bronze, and then it went to what? Iron, and then it went to what? Clay. The same way, these animals also are inferior to the next. There's a reason for that. We're going to get to that. Now look at verse 6. After this I beheld and lo, another beast like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a fowl. This beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now, right in your, 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 your line there, the nation of Greece. The nation of Greece. Now, the leopard is probably the most agile and graceful animal of the wild beast. <coughs> small in frame, very small in frame, but it's strong, it's swift, and it's fierce. Now, the leopard, the leopard here represents none other than Alexander the Great. And we're going to look at that further as we move through this. He represents Alexander the Great. And we'll talk more about that in chapter 8. Now listen, the lion overpowers its prey, the bear crushes its prey, but the leopard leaps and springs, if you will, upon its prey. Now the four wings of this leopard were the four wings of a what? Of a fowl. So these wings represent the swiftness in which Alexander took over the whole known world. When the Medes and Persians came against the Greeks, they had hundreds of thousands of troops. Guess how many troops Alexander the Great had? He only had 35,000 troops. And he went up against an army of 100,000 100, people. They were completely outgunned. They were outnumbered. Wow. Now, Alexander, though, he was smart, man. He was a strategician, very tactful in war. Super smart. In fact, he was the first person to use chariots in battle, if you will, in a in a in a in an organized, methodic way. Now, there's been chariots in other battles. Don't get me wrong, but he was first to use chariots in battle that he would put knives and blades on the side of the wheels, and so these blades that were wrapped around these wheels, he would rush into the. To, to the rushing crowd, and those blades on those wheels would slice those people as it moved through the crowd. And he put all of those things on all of his chariots. So that right there took out a bunch of people without them having to do anything but just rush into a crowd of people. Now people uh, wondered how such a small army could conquer the Medes and Persians' massive army, and it, it was said, and I quote, a wonder that could not be explained. Well... But I can explain it, and I can totally explain why 35,000 people army decimated an army of over 100,000 people. How do I know? Look at verse 6. And dominion was given to it. Who gave it dominion? God Almighty gave it dominion. Amen? And whatever God decrees, what happens? It's going to happen. Period. So the lion had the wings of an eagle, but notice now the leopard had the wings of a what? A fowl. Again, it's inferior. It's going down. Amen? What do the four heads represent, Brother Dave? Well, you come back next Wednesday and we'll talk about that. Amen? Oh, man, it's time to stop. Oh, I don't want to stop. Don't stop. Man. Mm-mm-mm. Well, you know, if I were to say, hey, would you mind if I go? Of course, you guys would be gracious and say yes, but 
but maybe in your heart you're saying, brother, man, my south side's starting to hurt, man. Amen? <laughs> Amen? I'll tell you what, let's just stop there. I want to honor the time. And we'll, we'll continue. Now we have one more beast to look at. And we'll, we'll start our next time in verse number 7. We'll look at that that nondescript beast, that beast that was wild and more different than all the other beasts. And we'll look at uh, all that's going on with that, and then we'll bring all this together. And i got to tell you what, man, the book of Daniel is an exciting book. It's an awesome book. It's a book that teaches you, hey, listen, don't be a sign watcher, but, man, it should motivate you to be a soul winner. Amen? Amen. Why? Because when you see all that's going to take place, and when you see all that God is doing, and you see it from his perspective, and it'll help motivate you to say, you know what, I don't need to get bogged down in all the politics that go on. Who's going to be the president? Who's, who's doing this? Who's doing that? Who, who's corrupt? Who's not corrupt? I mean, you can get depressed watching TV like that. Amen. And you can worry yourself to death about who's doing what and what they should be doing and how come they're not doing it and all those things. But what God's teaching us is that we're going to see this more clear. Listen. I'm in control of all the chaos that looks chaos to you, but it's not chaotic to me. I'm in control of it all. Amen. Nothing surprising me. No one's getting away with anything. There's not one trick, not one evil deed, not one misused word, not one thought that escapes my notice. All of it's going to be brought up to accountability to me. Amen. Amen. So it gives us peace that God can truly be the eye in that storm for our lives. Amen. Amen. Now, it's easy to preach, but it can be difficult to really focus on and live. Amen? Yes, indeed. Uh, let's see.